What is your major malfunction, num nuts? No, Kelly Clarkson. There's no crying in baseball. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. You're gonna need a bigger boat. Precious. Are you gonna bark all day, little doggy, or are you gonna bite? Frankly, my dear, I don't give a flick. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode three of I Don't Give a Flick. I'm Johnny Blackburn. And I'm Gary Elmore. And we are back again with high demand, even though we actually have not aired our first three episodes yet. We are recording them all. Yeah. Recording all of them. We're in a row. Three in a row. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tuning in, though. If uh, you enjoyed our first two podcasts, uh, we've uh, we've always got uh, here at here at I don't give a flick. We've got debates just as hot as the molten center of an excessively nuked hot pocket, and the knowledge is as cold as the center of a hot pocket as well. Because if it's uh, not cooked right, no. I mean, if you make a hot pocket, it'll be hot and cold at the same time. Okay, I that. was going to say something like the knowledge is as pertinent as a toe knife, and if you don't understand that reference, shame on you. Go Google toe knife. Always sunny in Philadelphia, right now. Danny DeVito, shout out if you're listening. I love you. Yeah. Yes, with the toe knife, you can really shave some time. Are you, are you I will add a drum roll cricket. Right now you're tonight. gonna add a. Are you okay? I was hoping no. you were gonna add crickets, but no, no, that was good. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, so what are we talking about here today? This Johnny? this week, uh, we're gonna or this episode at least, we're gonna go ahead and dive right into the world of 1960s film and Ooh. the history that shaped cinema during that decade. Uh, this is gonna be an ongoing. This is going to be an ongoing topic. We're going to go ahead and start with the 60s here and work our way up to the current 2010s, which we briefly covered in our last episode with uh, Ian Webb uh, from the podcast Movies So Good They're Bad. No, 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 Um, no. That's the other way around. Movies So Bad They're Good. Is that the second time I've done that? That is. I am horrible at giving shout outs to people. (laughs) Yes. Please, please don't stop it, listening it, to us it, just because I can be an idiot. It is movies so bad, they are good. But what about movies so good, they're bad? That wouldn't really make a lot of sense, would it? It, it could if we lived in a bizarro world. Very true. and But unfortunately, we do not. We do not. Well, that we know of. We could be in the Matrix for all you know. This is true. It's very possible. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, no, getting back on topic here. You know, what was so interesting when... Gary and I were doing our research for this particular topic was that the 60s are very much like the last decade of film that we've had in the 2010s. Well, how so, Johnny? Well, I'll tell you. Thank you very much for asking, Gary. Thank you. I thought I was just going to have to stay silent the entire episode. No, no. Perfect. You're going to (laughs) talk. It's a podcast. I I love doing that. They're not here for the visuals. I love here. Yeah. Like you said, we have faces made for radio. Exactly. Uh, no, you know, prime, the 60s were such a, they were such a fun and entertaining time and such a pivotal, uh, pivotal, <laughs> such a pivotal change during the cinematic landscape and how it was shaped in America and really, really international cinema over the next, you know, at this point, you know, 50 to 60 years. It was the rise of the independent, uh, independent film companies. It was the f- collapse of the studio system. Uh, you know, at the time, theaters were finding it very, very difficult, movie studios, excuse me, were finding it very, very difficult to turn a large profit like they had been able to during the golden era of Hollywood between, uh, you know, the mid-1910s up until uh, the early 60s, uh, primarily because at the, well, we'll go into a couple couple different things of it, but it was just interesting, you know, just kind of how theaters right now, and we had talked about this a little in our episode two. And he means uh, movie theaters. Yes, not, movie uh, theaters. Not ones with wooden boards. I hate you so much. Why, Good. Why, why am I doing this podcast with you? Why don't I just do it with someone because else? Because you're locked up in Corona land. That's true. We There's are nowhere else to right go. That, that is true. As soon as this quarantine is over, I'm finding I haven't left the house in eight weeks. And it and it can show. And it does show. I need a haircut. A very disheveled look right now. Thank you. I appreciate that. Get a haircut, man. I I wish I could. Why did you take a shower last? 
Um, I, uh, I, uh, before Valentine's Day, I think. Okay. Yeah, not too bad. Wow. No, that's that's not bad at all. Yeah. Yeah, it's May 1st. I'm surprised you haven't had a date since then. I know. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, let's, I guess, start off with uh, kind of going with what the turn of the decade, so 1960, what kind of was going sure. on there with the studios? So so at the time, for those, for those of you that... That, that aren't familiar with the studio system. And we'll go into this in a, if you guys are interested in hearing about the uh, cinematic landscape of the 50s, 40s, 30s, comment below and let us know. Uh, and that that's kind of one that's been, it's, it's really been lost over the last, really over the last couple of years, you know. Um, it's a very small percentage of the population that actually see film that really are familiar with movies from back then and are even interested which, in hearing about which it. Which is a shame because those are some it of is. the best movies. Yeah. It is some of the best. The film seen. noirs. And, oh, uh, man. You know, it was it was the golden age of movie musicals and, uh, you know, for those of you that, that enjoy them. Uh, the big thing here was that the studios at the time, there were five large ones. In particular, you had MGM, uh, you know, you had... Uh, you Paramount, had Paramount, Universal, Universal. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, Warner Brothers. There, you, you had the you had the big five, and what they had done is they basically had a complete monopoly on the system. They not only controlled all the studio lots in the United States, or the majority of them at least. Uh, they also controlled the distribution companies that distributed the films, and then on top of that. They controlled the exhibition of the films, so... Get they, out. They did, I know. Oh, my gosh. Facts you didn't know before. Uh, they can. They controlled the movie theater chains. So you saw you saw the MGMs and the Warner Brothers and, and, and the Paramounts. You saw them control every facet and every level of the film industry at that time. Um, you know, at the time... TV, televisions in homes weren't really a big thing. Uh, they People had them, but they were pretty rare for mm-hmm. the most part, especially mm-hmm. in rural areas um, and even a lot of urban areas for that matter. Um, so at one point I was reading, I was reading this, I was telling you about it. Um, one of the stats that we had read was that at one point on average during that golden era, era of film, 80 million People were going to theaters every week, every not every month. Week. Every week. I mean, that's that's just ridiculous. Especially you know? when you consider the population of the United States in the 1960s mm-hmm. was about you know 150 or 160. Right, million. but that and what's funny is that 80 million was bef- was prior to 1960. That right. was 40 and 50. So what would have have yeah, been around about then? 140? That's ridiculous. Yeah. So. Wh- so, you know, 60% of the country, if not more, were going to see films on a weekly basis. Yep. And a lot of them were seeing more than one mm-hmm. as well. Um, so that was a big thing. So because the five major studios, they had such a monopoly on the system of film, uh, there was something called the Paramount case where a whistleblower had finally come out and had said, hey, you know, all these studios, you know, they're they're – they got us by our balls and they are the only ones making any money off this at all. Um, they, they were also doing something called, excuse me. Um, they're doing something called burping, <laughs> burping. Yes. Uh, God, you know what? You're going to have to edit past this because I forgot it was block looking. You will have to edit past this portion. Um, book blocking. Yes. Block booking. I keep getting that wrong. I keep switching them up or yeah. you don't. Maybe people can laugh at how unprepared I was for that portion. It's okay. Block booking was when the studios would take their A-list film and they'd go up to the, they go up to the owners of the, uh, or I guess the people that had a, a, a share in the theaters. And they say, look, you can have this, you can have this large film with these A-list stars that everybody wants to see, but you have to take four or five of our other less recognized films, our crappier versions. Crappy actually. Movies, so yeah. here's the A list, and here's two to four B and C list movies, mm-hmm. and you have to buy all of them. And that was incredibly lucrative for the major uh, for the major motion motion picture companies. Yeah, a lot um, of those movies you can still see today on Mystery Science Theater, I believe. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Ian has talked about a number of those movies that were released under that system. I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, so that, that was, a, that was a big thing. So the collapse and dissolving from the federal government finally coming in and 
putting those limitations on the large company, uh, the large movie studios saying, look, you guys can control the making of the movies, but you cannot control the distribution and you definitely can't control the movie chains. So what they had to do is they had to take their companies and break them into smaller companies and therefore a huge, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't do any of the block booking anymore. Um, that a huge huge profit was was lost for those companies um that was big uh, another portion was post world war ii there was a lot of money that families had saved up um and that they were getting back you know just from you know the great depression being over right, and the war bonds and right all that. exactly they were finally coming to fruition and paying paying the uh, paying the population back so people had a lot of money and you started to see in the 40s the rise of uh people buying homes mm -hmm. started it was just drastically it was just drastically larger than it had been in decades prior uh so people they were they had a lot of money but they were spending it on the home so they didn't have as much recreational funds uh during that time so in the early 60s apparently half of every household in the united states had a television inside their home wow can um, you imagine that Half the people in the world having a television. <laughs> back then it was a big deal. Okay, now you know, fucking everybody's got one. But back then, um, you know, I even even talking to our parents and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think yours probably say the same thing. You know, in the '60s, the household revolved around the television, and it revolved around whatever was playing that night. Whether you were watching, you know, Johnny Carson on on Tonight Show, or you were watching I Love um, Lucy. I love, yeah, exactly. You know, or any of the any of the sitcoms coming out. So people. Basically, a lot of the a lot of um, cinema and film historians have said that that decline in the film industry was uh, also due to the fact that people wanted a free form of entertainment that they had right in front of them. You know, at that time, there were only three major mm -hmm. television networks. There was CBS, ABC, and NBC. Right. And they all started to finally offer 24-hour-a-day mm -hmm. broadcasting. And it, it, what I, I think is great is that uh, TV is a, it's a free medium and it always, right. always will be like, you never have to pay for TV. That's, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's not going to change. Okay. Yeah. You don't yeah. think it's going to change there? Nope. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see there. We'll see there, Gary. Gary likes to troll our audience a lot. He's a, he's a fun guy. Troll. Troll, lo, lo, lo. troll, lo, lo, lo. So what's, 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 yeah. What's, what's interesting about that is the conveniency factor and the overall, the overall, I guess the, you know, being cheap and more frugal, you mm -hmm. know, um, is it's, it's relevant not only back in the sixties, but it's relevant today, you know, with the streaming services and what we talked about in the last episode, um, the movie theaters worrying about more theaters closing over the next decade, uh, more so than in the history of, you know, in, in the history of the country, especially today with, uh, the coronavirus we have, uh, it's certainly having a immediate and quick impact on, I think, uh, all the movie theaters. Um, all of them are closed right now, pretty much. They are. And you know, they're, they're losing a lot of money. And right now, a lot of those theaters started by the movie pass, which bombed so hard. I, I don't understand how, well, I do. I mean, no, I understand. Oh, are you they kidding? had a really stupid model. It was a horrible model. They just had, they, I mean, they were just hemorrhaging money from so, the start. Um, when I, when I first bought the movie, I'm going to digress on this yeah, point. When I first bought the movie pass, I thought the movie pass company got together with the movie theaters and they said, okay, think. you pay us money and we'll get more people into your theater where they will buy, you know, your, your overpriced popcorns and sodas and candy bars and we'll make money for every person that's in there. But what they actually did was they would just take the, you know, $15 or whatever it cost a month and then pay for your ticket. With like no discount, it was a debit card for movies. Yes. Essentially, is what it was. It, it made no sense. <laughs> it was it was terribly done. Yeah, and so now what you see, I don't even know if movie pass is around anymore, to be quite honest. Um, but now you see all of the or what they were doing, all of the major theater chains, uh, Cinemark, Regal, Alamo, AMC. AMC, all of them. They're now doing obviously their own movie passes, and so I think that's really going to help them. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when it, you're only paying twenty bucks a month, you can see you know. In some cases, three movies, and in some cases, unlimited movies each week. Right. Um, it's it's really going to help yeah. at least sustain the current longevity of of film of right. theaters being open. Because it's not necessarily from the movie where the theaters make money; it's from uh, concessions. Right. And That's a, uh, yeah, that is a gigantic yeah. one. And I mean, that may I don't know what I mean, they're going to do with in terms of actually letting the studios 
you know, show their movies, but you know, six bucks for a bottle of Dasani. Are you joking me? I wouldn't pay more than a dollar fifty. You you have just in go, the past. I can just go to my gas. I can just go to the local gas station and I can buy three of them for less than one at the but, movie theater. I just sneak them in. Well, I can put them in my pants. You, pretend I got a big a big load. You know, you, you can't you can't sneak them in. That's against policy. Oh yeah, it's against the rules. You've yeah. never you've never snuck food into a theater before. No, I I have not. I will not really? admit to a crime on a podcast. Okay. That would not be what I do. You're a liar. Oh my! I can see right through your facade, oh, oh, and it's goodness. dirty looking. It's real dirty looking, oh. and I don't like the look on you. I'm ashamed of you for lying. Of course, I should be ashamed of myself for breaking the rules. I yeah. suppose, we're, but we're I'm both a rebel. Shameful people, yes, we are. I'm a rebel. I don't really have any shame. You know, it's true. You're shameless, <laughs> just like the William H Macy movie series, TV show, whatever. Yeah. You know, <laughs> very, very, two very different things. You know, it's the same thing. Well, I don't know about today. Anyways, um, yeah. So those were two large reasons. You know, uh, television, television in particular. Um, you know, it had finally started to not only air very realistic sitcoms and television shows about real everyday life. Uh, you know, between like the what the Andy Griffith show and um, around that time was Leave It to Beaver came out. Yeah, and, and you had uh, like TV shows like One Adam Twelve, which was uh, kind of the first cop show. Dragnet. Yeah, I forgot uh, about that. Yeah, you you do always talk about that one. Um, you know, they had a uh, sketch variety shows were really big. You know, Dick yeah. and Dyke show. Um, yeah, there there were a ton. Um, you know, the ta- the late night talk shows were Twilight really big. Zone. Twilight Zone was a huge one. Yeah. And one of the things that we had been reading about was political commentary was really non-existent in all forms of media outside of print right. up until that point. And so finally with the first ever presidential debate between Nixon and Kennedy mm-hmm. and then, you know. Um, which, which is a really interesting debate to watch if you ever – you can find it on YouTube. I've seen the highlights of yeah, some of them. And uh, it, pieces you know, of it, yeah. it, it's just like you would not recognize that as a – presidential debate watching that today oh yeah Uh, that's uh, we could probably make an entire podcast on just that um but the fact that tv journalism had finally started to catch up with print and really started to overtake it 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 took decades i mean don't get me wrong but tv was the ultimate medium at the time where currently today you know the ultimate medium is uh, the internet really it is the internet you know it's social media at this point you know you can you That's can post any type of terrifying you can really truly, really, you can post any type of high quality low budget commercial and market it by yourself on social media you know if you and if you need an expert an expertly done commercial then you can go to Leadfeather Productions yeah. based out of Austin Texas yeah, you know go they'll to take care of w- all of your needs www dot leadfeather productions dot com. com that's plural not singular exactly. productions with an s at the yeah. end yeah anyways enough plugging our own business um <laughs> so yeah that that was that was the large thing you know you also saw during that time because of the collapse of the studio system and the major studios you finally saw major actors like Frank Sinatra and Gregory Peck and Cary Grant, Jimmy Stewart, just name Catherine them. Hepburn. Catherine Hepburn. Yeah. They started going off on their own, and they do what they do what major Hollywood stars do today, and they created their own production companies. And they went out, found their own scripts, made it on their own dime, and then they sold that to the movie studios, who in turn would then get it to the distribution and so forth. So the money at that point started to become more widespread. Also, the guys that were the, you know, the tycoons of film at the time, the MGMs, the Paramounts and all that, they were just, they were just old and outdated with their viewpoints. You know, I mean, they just, there were so many, there were so many flops with large budget movies like I think the one that comes to mind is Cleopatra. Cleopatra for sure. Bankrupted Um, MGM. I mean that's it's it's just it's ludicrous to me the fact that they didn't figure out that they should be filming this kind of stuff overseas before in the late 50s early 60s you started to see a dramatic shift in uh, epic war movies being shot over in Europe Great Britain Italy Spain so forth um, which in turn then led to the rise of artistic Euro cinema, which then inspired the new generation of Hollywood, which is the big point of us talking today, exactly. the type of films being created in the 60s. Yeah, and in addition to the collapse of the studio system and the rise of the uh, independent artists, this was all done on the backdrop of the uh, the 1960s, which was its own turbulent decade in and of mm-hmm. itself. Mm-hmm. I mean, you started the, the decade um, much differently than you finished it. So you think, you know, the sound of music is considered widely, I think, is the last kind of 
a Hollywood musical. That it was, it was, was sad to see the end yeah. of the musical era because you're right. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, Sound of Music, West Side Story. Um, yeah, I mean, they had a, they had a, co- a couple yeah. other ones in there, but yeah, you're. It, yeah. it was just it was the end of an era because those had been the primary money makers mm-hmm. for the big studios for 15 to 20 years. Yeah, and so Sound of Music was 1965, and then. Uh, you, we get into the end of the decade, so 1968, was a very turbulent year for the United States. You had uh, Martin Luther King shot, you had uh, Bobby Kennedy shot, you had the Tet Offensive, uh, you had just sort of a lot of erosion of public faith in institutions, um, right. which was starting to be you know displayed in cinema, uh, and then carries through into the 70s, I think, to yeah. its ultimate effect. Yeah, it, and it, it really brings out the anarchist Type right movie and stuff you know you see that with just the kind of the the uh, the absurdist eccentric type pieces the 2001 mm. a space odyssey um you know you saw that a lot with oh god even rosemary's baby and oh geez what else uh, planet of the apes right so yeah uh, just you, a lot of those a, a lot of different kinds of movies uh less wholesome uh more critical of society more gritty more gr- more you know? gritty more yeah. realistic in in some ways i mean uh the von trapp family is not escaping uh from nazis in uh the late 60s is the same way they would in the mid 60s it's true this yeah. is very this is very true very true um so just you know, just I, I do want to I do want to touch on uh, I do want to touch on a couple of the f- a couple of the films that kind of changed the land- landscape of how Hollywood began to go into the more indie mm-hmm. uh, or anarchist type film in the seventies and eighties. Um, so an, a, a big one we were talking about, uh, at least the way it was especially in the way it was shot, was Lawrence of Arabia. Right. So you, as technology progressed, uh, you moved from having these cameras that weighed hundreds of pounds. Took six people to operate. Yeah, took numerous people to operate. Um, you had to you know, change the film every uh, couple of hundred feet um, to, uh, I don't want to call them portable cameras, but they were much more compact and you know, able to be moved. So you could really start filming Um, in the real world as opposed to mainly filming inside of a studio which is what you had um you know prior to the 60s so like lawrence of arabia was filmed you know they went out into the desert for two years and filmed these just beautiful shots of these these desolate landscapes to to tell this story um and it was you had new types of cinema being put out there like um uh cinemascope which is a uh just it's a gigantic screen it's like wider than we even have today for widescreen um which gives you just a, a really a big horizontal and that helps depict space a lot better and these were you know new technologies that came around and allowed filmmakers to play a little bit more with how they wanted the audience to feel and the perceptions they wanted them to have of the movie Right, and you know what I what I really noticed. We watched one of the more iconically shot scenes earlier, and with that one, it was the first time that I had at least seen because I, I think both of us have a fairly a fairly deep knowledge mm-hmm. of movies in the fifties, forties, thirties. You know, we've just growing up, you know, hanging out with our grandparents, which shows right. a lot of that stuff or whatever. Yeah. Um, I hadn't really seen before that much depth of field. In, in shooting and stuff, you know, you had shown me the portion where it's a quick shot of, it's a quick shot of um, Peter O'Toole's face, and then it's another quick shot of the desert, and it shows the mirages that he's about to see, it shows the heat rising from the sand, but it's supposed to be from like, you know, a quarter of a mile away, or a half a mile away, and it was the first time that it wasn't intimate. Like it had yeah. been in this when the studios were shooting everything prior to the '60s, right? Because you, you know? just can't really get a shot um, with that kind of uh, grand grand scheme of things. Like, I mean, sure, you, you look back to you know '39 and Gone with the Wind, and they did a, a remarkable job with the one crane shot that pulls up and shows all the dead bodies mm-hmm. uh, from the from the battle. But it's not 
quite the same thing since, you know, they use, you know, they use trickery like matte paintings to make it look like a more impressive space than it was. But it's really just sort of the back lot of the studio, of the MGM studio, whereas this was actually filmed in the middle of the desert. And so you have that, that openness that, uh, that you just don't get inside of a building. Right, exactly. So, kind of, kind of transitioning over from that to another epic battle movie, which I know is one of your favorite of all time. Right. Um, it was just completely packed with stars from front to back. With you know, mm. is the longest day. Yes. And for, I honestly, I, I think the majority of people out there are not really familiar with this movie, regardless of the star power that was behind it. Yeah, it pretty much had every major Hollywood star. Uh, at the time, I think it was mm-hmm. 1962. Yeah. So you um, had John, who you have John Wayne, Burt Lancaster, yeah, Sean Connery, oh. Gert mm-hmm. B. Frobe. Mm-hmm. Um, Gert B. Frobe played Goldfinger, so he's probably not well known. But <laughs> only rem- you would I know remember that. his name. Only you yes. would know that. Um, oh. You know, you had. Uh, if you think of a star that was somebody that was famous in, uh, you know, the the turn of the or the mid century, mm-hmm. you're they're gonna pretty much be in that movie. And, you know, that was, I think, um, a really epic movie because Mm -hmm. I I don't think they'd ever had an ensemble cast like that before. I mean, the only, even today, the only movie I can think of that would have, you know, nearly that star power uh, would probably be in the game and only in the game because yeah. that had all I'd of, say yeah most of the Avengers movies yeah in particular in game of yeah. course yeah sure I mean but like I mean that just had everyone that was famous and that had the I think the, I'm pretty sure and correct me if I'm wrong but that had the highest payroll out of any cast in the history of film I, just, I, just I would on believe cast. that I, I'd yeah. have to double check that but I, I would definitely believe that because you had a lot of major stars in yeah. there so I, I guess let me, the question I posed to you is what was the difference from the longest day a, move, a, a war epic that was, you know, for a while was at the end of its rope. This was kind of the end of the studios making those big budget. And mm-hmm. it was one of the last successful ones that they had. What was the difference between that and, you know, another war movie that, that you oh, that you really love? Okay. Like what, what made it so special? What made it so what made it so iconic? Well, I, I think it was iconic just because the, the scope of it. I mean, you had mm-hmm. uh something like 53 major actors that were in this movie Mm -hmm. and they, you know, it it was not just one single story. It was, you know, six or seven or eight major plot lines that were kind of all going on at the same time. Okay. If you watch the um, original version, the, the Germans in that spoke German. So you had to read the Mm -hmm. subtitles, the French spoke French. So it it made it much. uh, They didn't just they didn't cop out and make everybody speak English with a German accent or a French accent. Well, they 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 did do that for uh, one of the releases. Um, Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, but they but um, you know it was just it was just really an immersive movie um, in terms of uh, how how large it was. I would contrast it with like 1917 because that's the like exact opposite Mm -hmm. because you have just one very very tight story so yeah um which you don't which is funny you don't see a lot nowadays you typically see movies that have seven or eight plot lines going on all at once and then somehow at the end they they all kind of come together and tie in at the end Mm -hmm. so really that was another reason why it was just such a change of pace film because they not only had they never had a war movie do that before they never really done that with any film right you know um or at least on that scale right yeah such a large budget yeah i think in terms of number of famous people uh that's probably not been topped top since then Yeah. yeah no i mean you're 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 probably you're probably right um so uh you know another another big thing people this this is it's the 60s where they were such an interesting decade and such an intricate part of the growth of how we see cinema today and i guarantee you the majority of you out there your favorite decade for cinema where your favorite movies came out or your favorite style at least you know is probably in between you know the 70s to the 2000s i would guess you know 80s to the 2000s at least Mm -hmm. um but what a lot of people forget, because some of his stuff wasn't black and white, was this is when Alfred Hitchcock really took off. Right. You know, yeah. this is when the when he was finally, you know, the big studios, since they had been losing so much money because of the things we had already named, they were only going with scripts that were safe and cautious, very much like today with the from the last episode, the mm-hmm. remakes and the sequels and stuff. That was it was a little different. They didn't have a ton of remakes and sequels, but they stayed safe and they didn't 
they didn't go outside the box. And then Hitchcock comes along and he brings us Psycho and he brings mm-hmm. us the birds. And it is many, many film historians claim to be the birth of, you know, the thriller, s- yeah. the thriller. Yeah. yeah. Like the, you know, the psychotic, you know, overly analytical, mm-hmm. there's a message in every shot type film. Right. And, and yeah, exactly. And you, you didn't have psychological thrillers like that before Hitchcock came along. And today it, there's a plethora of them. Right. I mean, you can, you can, I can, I can throw, a, I can throw a rock five, right. five but, feet and I can hit three of them. Yeah. You know, most of them are crap though. But I mean, like, well, yeah, you know, that's it's, true. <laughs> you know, uh, just, <laughs> there's a lot of crap out there, but everybody's aware that the first shot of a toilet was in, uh, Psycho, which is very interesting. See, I didn't know that. Okay, well, yeah. that's why people tune into this podcast because uh, because of you know imperative information like that that it's they have to know to, to claim that they they know a little bit more about film history. But uh, Hitchcock also, um, and he really deserves his own episode at least. But you know, he just was able to the way he could direct and see how to frame a shot was just so different and how it could tell the story and he would play with the audience's perception mm-hmm. so in psycho um they uh the movie starts off with uh the lady whose name escapes me right now and she's she's stolen the money Tippy and, was no Tippy hedron was the bird was the birds right right okay um and she's stolen the money and she goes to the motel and the camera's with her the whole time and then when she goes to you know check in it's behind her and we see um norman bates and you know checks her in and then she start she walks off frame and as an audience member since we've been with her the whole time we're expecting the camera to pan with her and go out the door and continue on with her life and whatever she's doing but it stays on norman bates because this movie's really about him and you know that's just one of the kind of new creations that uh happened you know in the 60s yeah, and I think another thing which will, you know, ho- horror films in general, you know, psychological thrillers, you know, we can have probably in the future other podcasts to those themselves. But one thing that I hate about horror and psychological thrillers today, horror movies in particular. Jump scares. Is it's all the jump scares and it's all blood and guts and it's all how fucked up can we make this to make the audience's stomach curdle. And that's fine. Like there, there are some really good movies that do that. But I think the true artistry and the true genius of classic horror and psychological thrillers is how Hitchcock set it up with piece by piece, scene by scene, Mm -hmm. shot by shot. He just draws you in. And when you think something's coming, it's not. And he like raises your anxiety up to that climax. Mm -hmm. And then he brings it down just a notch. And then he keeps bringing it up and brings it down and brings it up and brings it down. And he does it for, you know, the whole, the, the oh, whole movie. Yeah. It's like, you know, 20, 25 minutes on end until something finally happens. Yeah. And then you just don't know how to expect it. And that's what makes it scarier. And, you know, I mean, I always rave about James Wan, the creator. For those of you who don't know, the creator of uh, the Conjuring series, Insidious, the original Saw. Um, you know, he he's able to do that as well. He's able to be – they're both masterful in how they keep you on edge through – for, through framing and the shots, but also the sound. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, the the Foley artists and the uh, composers that work on those films. I mean, they did, should did be, a fantastic. They did. Job. They should be yeah. getting paid the biggest and, bucks because that's that's what keeps me coming back to watching movies like that. And you know? if you want to see a movie, probably the best movie about suspense, I would say that's probably Rear Window that I think came Rear out Window in sixty four uh, uh, or something around there. Uh-huh. It could have come out in the 60s. Let me double check on that. But uh, that's just one of those best, uh, the best movies that kind of show like a slow building. 1954. Okay. So, right. But uh, Hitchcock on the Lex. Um, so it just really shows um, really great uh, pacing. Yeah, it, it, re- it really does. You know, I think the really, the really cool thing about this era is the freedom and the artistic expression that people were allowed to have because the monopoly and the stranglehold that mm-hmm. the studio system had on the entire industry was almost completely collapsed at that point. Right. Um, so another one that personally I've, I've, I've 
always found it a little overrated, but that's just me. 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, I, I know how much you like. So it's a how very slow you, movie. It, it is. A and very may, slow movie. Maybe, maybe that's it for me and the fact that I, I haven't seen it since I was a teenager. It's, it's, a, you know? it's a Kubrick movie, so it's very weird, yes. too. Like, doesn't yeah. make sense. Um, what did what did you feel like when you had – I mean, you've seen it multiple times. Mm-hmm. So what did, what did you feel like that one had – and what did it what did it propel into the film today like what did it what type of you know what the the kubrick style you mm-hmm. know what what exactly did it i i think one of the most interesting portions of that movie was um the leap forward in terms of um special effects mm-hmm. so i think that came out in 66 i want to mm-hmm. say uh yeah, keep going yeah keep going. and um you know if you look at that movie um and you compare it to star wars which uh comes out in 1977 um 2001 looks better than star wars even though it's uh you know a decade plus older and they actually used a lot of 2001 models on star wars i think mm, 68 by the way 68 okay so nine years um but like just the level of detail and the exactitude and it was also a creature of its time because 1968 you know the space race um mm. was going on uh the united states was trying to land a man on the moon uh which they would do the next year and just you know we didn't you know it was a very exciting time and kind of also a very terrifying time i mean because he kind of you know, loses his mind for lack of a better yeah. term. Which uh, is, which is kind of, you know, we had, we had, we, we try to put a lot of things into the, you know, the 45 minutes to an hour and a half that we yeah. do each week or each episode. Um, and one, one of the things I want to touch. So the social commentary, again, that's right, portrayed yeah. in 2001 A Space Odyssey, you think the, the, when the initial screenplay was written, a lot of that was the Cold War in mind and how that was kind of yeah. making certain Americans fear the potential nuclear attack that could be coming from the Soviet Union and the insanity that was maybe driving parts of the country, country too, maybe? You know, I, I would, I wouldn't say that. I would, I would say that, um, it was more about the, um, the expression of both hope and fear in technology. Um, okay. Cause, uh, you know, how, um, <laughs> is, uh, you know, trying to survive up in space and, you know, has to, uh, you know, battle a computer to, to do that. Right. Uh, but like in the sixties, you did have a lot of movies that started talking about social commentary because of the, of the age. So in the 1960s, you had the, um, you know, the, the civil rights movement. And then you had movies coming out that spoke about that in plainer and more direct terms than ever oh. before. And, and one of, one of my favorite, more underrated movies of all time, Spencer Tracy, Sidney Poitier, and Catherine Hepburn. Mm-hmm. Guess who is coming to dinner or lunch? Or just lunch. kidding. The or lunch is, is wrong. No, guess who's coming to dinner? Um, was was just was just a classic. I mean, the fact that Sidney Poitier had already he had already established himself as one of the up and coming up and coming titans of you know Hollywood superstars at mm-hmm. the time, uh, and the first African American one for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, with with the roles that he was given, it was a changing time, and rightly so. Um, it just it touched on, I mean, it touched on every aspect of the civil rights movement. The fact that you know it was for those of you that aren't familiar, it was uh, it was a well-to-do family in California, California. I believe, yeah. and their daughter that had gone, uh, she had gone traveling, uh, a, a, I guess, a couple months before. Yeah, to and co- yeah, to, uh, to college wasn't it? Yeah, 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 I think, or like before college or yeah. something. And uh, she had met a very prominent doctor, mm-hmm. and she was bringing up. Uh, they were they were engaged to be married, right? And very quickly, like he. Oh yeah, he hadn't met the parents yet. Yeah, and so she had phoned ahead and let Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn know, "I'm bringing my fiance to dinner. I hope you like him. It's going to be great." And their parents for the for that time period were supposed to be fairly open minded. Yeah, uh, they were liberal people. Exactly. You know? Yeah, and they they pride it in, in the movie. They pride themselves on being that way. And then when the when Sidney Poitier comes and before there, uh, they're kind of debating like, you know, how are we actually going to handle this? Is this something we're you know, cool with, 
um, as the kids say these days. And uh, it was. It <laughs> Is was, that what the kids say? Yeah. Cool. Is that cool? Are, are we cool with we that? Radical? I'm down with that, Daddy O. Who the hell talks uh, like that? You're I do. stuck I do. in the uh-huh. 70s, dude. <laughs> so, well, we'll get to the 70s later. But, <laughs> That's next uh, time. You, know, you know, so it was just, you know, talking about a lot of uh, concerns and, you know, feelings that people were having um, at the time and seeing if they were able to actually live up to sort of the ideals that they had, you know, believed in. Um, so that was also a great movie, I think, too, because it was Spencer Tracy's last movie. And um, uh, mm-hmm. so Catherine Hepburn is a famous uh, technical actress, um, which... Uh, got the story. So I'm going to tell the story. Yeah, I know you're going to tell it. Yeah. I've heard it a million times, but go ahead. So, uh, you know, technical actress is uh, someone who uh, doesn't uh, become the character, but they portray the character. So they're not, if like their character's sad, they're not actually sad because they re- recognize it's just acting and it doesn't have to be something that, you know, drives you insane. It's a way of life, not just acting. Uh, so uh, she's a very <sighs> technical actress um, and there's a scene in it um, cause Spencer Tracy at this time is very sick. Um, and, uh, you know, he's going to have to retire from acting after this. And if you're not aware, Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy had a very long, uh, romantic history together. Very it's long. one of the great loves of Hollywood. How long was he, how long was one of them was married yeah, during Spen- the entire, right? Spencer Tracy was married. Okay. Yeah. yeah. How, yeah. Long, how long was that affair going on that they... I think that affair went on for like 20 years yeah, or so. Geez, um, and it, it, Gosh. Spencer Tracy's wife was aware of it, but they were Catholic, so they couldn't get divorced. Mm. Um, but anyway, so, the, you know, Catherine Hepburn, you know, you get to see some of her real human being emotions in that because, um, you know, Spencer Tracy's also very old in the movie. Uh, guess who's coming to dinner? And so just that loss that they're about to have, you, know, you get to see that. And that's a really nice uh beautiful moment it, it was you know and and a, a, one of the reasons actually it's funny that you bring that up one of the reasons that you saw so many actors pre-1960 through excuse me pre-1960 you know all the way back to the beginning of the golden age of hollywood was because the studios at the time outside of not only monopolizing how the industry was ran they also monopolized on their star actors and they signed them to these ludicrous contracts that were just so long in length basically the contracts would state look you can you know you can't work with any other studio outside of us you have to dedicate yourself for you know x amount of years you know 10 to 20 years you have to do you know 12 to 20 films blah 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 and it was just it, it was it was driven by by money and greed and they had they had no power um and so that's why you saw you saw a lot of you know Spencer Tracy Catherine Hepburn in a lot of the same movies um now granted Guess Who's Coming to Dinner was was eight years after primarily this had gone away, and they just enjoyed working together mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. Um, but, you know, seeing guys like Jimmy Stewart and Lionel Barrymore, um, you know, and, and people like that that you'd seen a lot of films, that was the reason for it was because they had to be in all those movies together because they were under contract. You know, they had sold their soul for decades. Right. But it, conversely, against that point, it was also kind of interesting because you had more of an acting troupe like uh, the old school theaters because these people would act together and they'd have to act together um, and they could not act together. So you, you didn't have quite the mixing of uh, stars uh, that you do today. Of so of course not. It's, it was so boring back then at cert, like certain movies and stuff that could have been better if you had mixed the chemistry up and tried something new. Well, I mean, it's called acting. So I know it's called acting. Like, so here, here's the thing for those of you that don't know, as you've probably figured out by now, Gary and I have known each other for a very, very long time. Over six months. Over six whole months. Uh, no, 20 years at this point. Literally, this year is 20 years. Mm. At 12 years old mm. in Mr. Tilney's French class. We oui. in Sixth Grade. Français. Yeah. Alouette, jante, alouette, alouette, jante, plumeure. Anyways, uh, <laughs> so we we you know we we did theater and acted together in in high school a lot. And Gary has always prided himself on being a uh, on being a, a technical actor and being a, a real child. Actor, you know. Get the hell out of here! Go fuck yourself. A child of the uh, the the Olivier 
method. I have always prided myself on being a very method actor, um, more along the line. He just can't control his emotions is what he's saying. (laughs) I hate you so much. Uh, more along the lines of being, you know, the Uta Hagen or the Meisner route, you know, where you become the character and, mm. you know, you talk in the dialect that your character is supposed to be, even if it's at home with your family at the dinner table. Uh, so for context in history, yes, that has not always gone to plan. For some mm-hmm. people, you've probably heard of how Heath, Heath Ledger. Ledger, yes, was a very methodical actor. He was a very methodical, methodical actor. And when he played the role of the Joker for The Dark Knight, mm-hmm. they stated that even after the film was over, one of the reasons they speculated that he committed suicide or he overdosed by accident was to get to become psychotic. He had to take a lot of different types of pills and a lot of different types of drugs to make him either not sleep at all during the night so he was crazy like in that crazy enough mindset to go on set and play a certain scene that day or shoot a certain scene and then he had to take a lot of a lot of fucking sleeping pills to get to sleep for 12 hours to make up for the lack of sleep he had the night before so essentially he went crazy because of his acting kathy bates did the same thing in uh, night mother in night mother where uh she actually had to go to counseling for over a so, yeah, year she, right uh, after she, she was on a play in, on broadway called night mother she mm-hmm. did that play for a year and so after that, she had to do counseling for two years. So Right, because she had become the character. And a lot of these characters, you know, they have these incredibly traumatic experiences that a normal human being would probably not encounter through their life. Um, or if they had, they've, they've probably somehow gotten over it. But they become the character in the middle of that most traumatic mm-hmm. point of their life. So anyways, I consider those types of actors to be more entertaining to watch. I consider them to be more genuine. And I think it's the truer art form, whereas technical acting is bland and uncreative. Oh, okay. Yeah. So well, no imagination yeah. whatsoever. Well, I like repeat performances. And, I know you uh, do, buddy. Heath Ledger's not going to be giving out any. So <laughs> that's a, that is a low blow. That I'm is just too, saying. Do we have, do we have a sound effect for too soon? <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh God. I'm so happy we never met him. Mm. So, yeah, so that's film in the 60s. Film, film in the 60s, a, a truly a truly fantastic decade that is honestly overlooked and forgotten about at this point. Mm-hmm. There's a few movies, that, and only a few of them that we mentioned that probably a lot of you have heard of. Though, yeah. Those of you that obviously have heard of more of them <laughs> or know more movies from yeah. that time than we do, sure, yeah. you may appreciate it to its fullest extent. Yeah, like The Graduate, um, right. the, yeah. a very famous movie from that time. Uh, You're trying to seduce me. Johnny. Oh, oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, like, there's, there's a lot of movies and a lot of styles that came around in the 60s that yeah. continue to influence movies today. It wasn't it wasn't just one, which was the really interesting portion. Mm-hmm. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, we were talking about during that golden age of cinema when the studios controlled everything. It wasn't just the happy-go-lucky, you know, everything's Wally Cleaver mm-hmm. down the street, you know. Big old, big old white house with the green lawn and the picket fence and the blue shutters. Like it, it actually became gritty. It became, you know, I, I use the anarchist form kind of loosely. I mean, there are a lot of films that weren't, but, um, it was, it was the birth, it was the birth of those types of films, the psychological thrillers, um, brand new types of film equipment, which we had talked Mm -hmm. about and different forms of shooting that really started to shape how we see and feel certain genres of movie, whether it be a horror or an action or a drama, right? Whatever yeah, it is, exactly. And it uh, continued to to play into the seventies with a lot of these themes. It continued to evolve, uh, of course, and even today they're they're still evolving. Um, we just started a new decade, twenty twenty. Uh, we are. Uh, I am afraid to see what comes of this decade because the 2010s were so rough all well, around. Well, I'm pretty excited. I mean, we're uh, four months down in this year so far, and uh, we've barely seen anything. We've we've had World War Three, oh, uh, the no. Australian fires. No, Gary, that is the Pentagon that is social just commentary. That we were talking about UFO. the films that came out. <laughs> That have come out well, so far, what, which are not a lot. Well, what, I mean, what I'm saying is, like, the films are going to come out after are, this are, are affected by that. Yeah. So sure. we're going to see probably a lot more films that are, I think going to be more intimate in the next year. So 
you know, people having to live at home with, with each other and how they deal with that. Uh, a lot more isolation films are going to kind of come out. I, I think, uh, you're going to get a lot of, you know, pandemic movies, of course. Um, yeah, I so, feel like that's, I feel like that's going to be way more prevalent yeah. over the next, at least over the next four or five years. than it has yeah, been in the past. Absolutely. Cause I feel like, you know, I mean, we've had, yeah, we had those, you know, we had, we had the the decade of it was superhero films, and then we mm-hmm. had the decade before that where it was zombie movies, right? And you know the decade before that where it was you know the trippy alien mind fucking movies yeah. and alien yeah. movies, yeah. So who knows? Who knows what the next decade is going to bring? Um, so well, ne- I'm I'm just, I'm just saying, like in 2009, we had the SARS virus, and then we had Contagion, like two years later. That is true, and that is true. Nobody talks about SARS or worries about it or anything at the time, and coronavirus everybody's whole life has changed so we're probably going to have dozens and dozens of movies you're probably right it is it is a changing of the times yep as our old friend bob dylan would say yep and uh we'll see if uh you know the brick and mortar movie theaters survive this if it turns into only uh drive-in movie theaters or if uh streaming movie services just completely take all the other ones out but come rain or shine um this podcast will be with you, guiding you through the future. Guiding you through the fog and the dark into the light. Follow us, my children, into a new decade of film. So uh, let's close by uh, asking, uh, Johnny, what is your favorite film from the 1960s? Oh, my God. It's yeah. so hard. God, there's so many. Uh I feel like you've already got one. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would say, you know, there were a lot of good ones, um, like the James Bond franchise started in that decade. But I'm going to say that The Lion in Winter um, is going to be my my top one. It's one. Uh, Catherine Hepburn and Peter O'Toole um, and, uh, oh my gosh, the guy that played Odin in... Um, uh, Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. Yeah, that's the that's the one. <laughs> you forget Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> I I don't and know. Only has some of the most the, one of the most iconic <laughs> antagonist roles in the history of cinema. And like, I don't know why I said the guy that played Odin when like Hannibal Lecter would have been a much better choice. But <laughs> yes, um, you know, and Timothy Dalton. But anyway, it's it's a great movie um, that was based on a play. And uh, if you uh, haven't seen it yet, I would highly recommend it. Um, It's about, um, you know, Richard III, uh, Henry II, Eleanor of Aquitaine, um, and just a a very uh, entertaining movie from the 60s, I would say. Uh, Yeah, no, I would have to agree that that's definitely one of that's definitely one of the better ones. Um, You know, I see this is this is the part that I get I get boggled down by because of how many fantastic and iconic ones there were, you know, between Spartacus and between, God, you know, Line of Winter, between Lawrence of Arabia, The Great Escape, which is probably mm. my favorite, my favorite of all time, uh, just World War II film. Um, really? It, it's okay. one of them. I mean, God, dude, Steve McQueen, I only wanted to learn to ride a motorcycle when I saw him trying to jump that fence yeah. is, the, is, the, is, the, is the only time that I really wanted to do it. And then I went out the next day, got on my dad's motorcycle, put up the kickstand and fell over. Okay. Scraped my knee and I've never gotten back on one since. Okay. Well, that, that's a good lesson to all you kids out there. <laughs> Don't try anything new. <laughs> my, <laughs> never try anything new. Yes, give up. But to, to this day still, my, my favorite one is going to have to be Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. Um, okay. I've, I've, prob- right. I've probably seen that one easily a dozen or so times okay over the um i mean you know sound of music is one of those classic it's it was the end of an era Mm -hmm. and i saw it a million times as a kid and i know more songs from that than probably probably majority of musicals you know outside of maybe i don't know les mis or wicked or something like that Um, okay there's a lot of there's a lot of classics you know and any hitchcock films all great too but but guess who's coming to dinner um that one i think that was that's that was the most transcendent out of out of that entire decade so that's just me though um next week though we will uh or i keep saying next week we might we'll probably well, film one sooner than that yeah, we'll when see. I, whenever we see next you guys again you know could be, could you be know, three weeks four yeah, weeks yeah. Who, knows? We who, knows? who knows we'll keep getting higher pitch with our <laughs> I, I can't go no i'm done my balls have dropped so yeah. i can't go as high as i used to um we will be talking he about will pick them up later though i promise you <laughs> we'll be talking about the 70s in our next episode um thanks so much for tuning in you guys stay safe out there okay um we are all in this together, and we'll get through it. Yep. Yes, you know, we will. We'll get through it. Once again, I am Johnny Blackburn. And I am Gary Elmore. You guys stay classy. 
The hills are alive with the sound of flicks. Flicks. I don't give a flick for a thousand years. And you will know my name is the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon thee. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? I'm funny how? I mean, funny like I'm a clown, I amuse you? He's looking at you. Wick!